I went from this to this. What did I use? Maybe the 76 by IK Multimedia or one of the various Waves compressors that I've got. Maybe a UAD. Nope, it was a spreadsheet. And I think as audio compressors go, it excels. Sorry about that. Before you think you misheard me, you didn't. I really have made a working audio dynamic range compressor in a spreadsheet. I didn't end up using Excel because my latest version of Excel is Office 2010 and it couldn't handle the volume of data, but I did manage to get it to work in the open source alternative, LibreOffice. Don't worry, I'll be showing you the spreadsheet later in the video, but first, let's talk compression. No, not that type of compression. I'm talking about audio dynamic range compression, the sort of thing you'd find in recording studios all around the world. See, as some of you may know, I do a lot of music production and I owned a studio for 14 years and people used to come in the control room and see all the stuff in the racks and say, out of all that rack gear, what's the most important stuff? And my answer would always be the same, the compressors. Audio compression allows you to shape audio signals, create and fill space, add attack and remove attack from drums, keep vocals and speech at a consistent volume in the mix. A really simple example of an audio compressor could be to run an amplified signal through a light bulb. As the signal gets louder, the light bulb gets brighter and soaks up some of the energy, which smooths out the volume overall. Processing audio like this is very rudimentary, but it's still a compressor. It's acting like a finger on a fader. It turns the signal down when it gets too loud, and then when it goes quiet, it turns it back up again. Very simple. I've got an audio compressor on my microphone now, and it's helping you to hear all the details of what I say. Even if I'm a little quiet, or sometimes a little loud, it turns me down and then puts me back up again to keep the volume level consistent. So let's get to the basics of how compressors work. The threshold defines the point where the signal becomes too loud. Everything below the threshold doesn't trigger the compressor, but everything above the threshold does trigger the compressor and gets turned down. But turned down by how much? Well, that's the second most common control, the ratio. A two to one ratio means that a signal that's 10 dB above the threshold will be turned down to five dB above the threshold. And a four to one ratio means that a signal 10 dB above the threshold will be turned down to two and a half dB above the threshold. The last two common controls are the attack time and the release time. You can look at these as adding some laziness into the process. If you had your finger on the fader and it suddenly got loud, how quick would you react? Well, that's the attack time. And once the signal stopped being loud, how long would it take you to notice and turn it back up again? Well, that's the release time. With only those four parameters, we can shape audio in so many different ways. Here's an example which shows the compression working visually. I've got an audio file loaded into Cubase, which is a one kilohertz sine wave. The first half of it hits 0 dB, and the second half is quieter at just under minus six dB. If we put this signal through a compressor and record the output to a new file, we can see that the volume of the first part is turned down based on the threshold and the ratio, but not immediately. This depends on the attack time, which you can see with this curve at the start of the wave file. And then when the sine wave drops below the threshold in the second part, it gets turned up. But again, not immediately. How fast it gets turned up or released is dependent on the release time. Okay, that's all great and everything, and it looks pretty on a sine wave, but what purpose does it serve in the real world? Take this drum sample. It's a single microphone in front of a drum kit. If I set the attack time to around 40 milliseconds and the release time to around 60 milliseconds, you can hear that it allows the punch of the bass drum and the snare drum through, but it dips the signal in between. The attack time and release time allow the compressor to turn the signal down between the bass drum and snare drum hits, which in turn adds punch to the signal. If you wanted to remove the punch, you could go with a fast attack time and a fast release time. This pulls down the volume of the bass drum and the snare drum and leaves the sound in between at a normal volume. A lot of people think that compressors make things louder, and that's not true, they only ever turn things down. 
But if you know the maximum amount that the peaks will be turned down by, then you can turn up the overall signal after the compression to make up for this. And this is the fifth most common control on a compressor, the makeup gain. Sometimes it's just the output volume, sometimes it's called makeup gain. There are loads of compressors out there to choose from and they've all got their own personal characteristics. Two of the most famous ones are the LA-2A and the 1176. The LA-2A has less controls than a lot of compressors. You only have a choice of two ratios with a switch that goes between compress and limit. The compress option gives you around a four to one compression ratio and the limit option's more like 20 to one. Very little gets above the threshold in limit mode. There's a peak reduction knob which sets the threshold and a knob for the output gain which sets the output volume. There are, however, no attack and release knobs and that's because the LA-2A is an old valve optical compressor by Teletronics. Introduced in 1965, the attack and release times are based on the natural reaction times of the circuitry rather than something you can control. But a few years later in 1967, Bill Putnam bought out the 1176, which not only had adjustable attack and release times, but four different compression ratios, four to one, eight to one, 12 to one, and 20 to one. The 1176 and all its updated models and clones are standards in studios all over the world, as is the LA-2A, because sometimes simple just works. Nowadays, all these popular analog compressors, which there are loads of, they're all modeled in software and they, they, they do a great job. You don't have to look far to find a vast range of compressors to choose from. But let's say you were a total psycho and instead of downloading a free or cheap plugin to compress your audio, you wanted to do it all by yourself. And by doing it yourself, I don't mean writing a plugin in code or wiring up a light bulb to your audio signal to get some rudimentary compression. No, none of that. I mean by making a spreadsheet. You see, a WAV file is just a list of numbers that gets plotted into a graph. And there's a common bit of software that we mostly all use that deals with numbers and graphs. It's called Excel. Now, as I previously mentioned, I don't have the latest version of Excel. I'm not intending on giving Microsoft any cash that I don't need to anytime soon. And because 99% of my office type work is very, very simple, I use the totally free and open source version, LibreOffice. And I'm not saying that because I'm some evangelical open source advocate that's got posters of Richard Stallman or Linus Torvalds on my wall. Nothing to do with any of that. It's because it's free and I'm a tight ass. So I'm sure you've had enough of me full screen. So let's go to more of me in a smaller screen. And I'm going to explain to you in a less scripted way how I implemented an audio compressor in a spreadsheet. So before we make the spreadsheet, we have to get the samples, the numbers, the list of numbers out of the WAV file. And uh, I wrote a little function in Node.js using JavaScript to get out that list of numbers. I'm not gonna go over the details of the code, but basically it takes in the WAV file here, does some stuff to it, and gives me a list of samples like that, a nice list of numbers. And this function up here, which is called samples to WAV, basically takes in a list of samples like these sign samples here, which all start with zero, but then do some stuff. Uh, and it takes them in and basically outputs a WAV file. Um, I'm gonna be including a link to all of this stuff in the description, so please download it, you know, modify it, play with it, do what you want. Um, so once I uh, got out the raw samples, um, which are actually some sign samples in for the first test, um, I put them into column A. And uh, then column B, very simply, is a, uh, a transformation of what's in column A. And the transformation is, first it takes the absolute value, which basically just chops off the sign, so if it's negative, it becomes positive. And then uh, I'll take a log 10 of the value. I'm not going to explain what log 10 is, basically because I'm not qualified to. But it's just a function in Excel and in LibreOffice. And basically, you can't take log 10 of, a, of zero. So I've got this wrapped in a thing that says, if error, then output zero. So we just get a zero. And as you can see, this number here, minus 6002, becomes 3.778295991. The next column is loudness, and this isn't a proper loudness calculation. Basically, what this is doing is looking back, so you can see I've got, I'm looking for the maximum value of the B cell that's next to it, and then I look back a certain number of values. So over here on the right, I've got the settings, and on here I've got the threshold, which we discussed earlier, which at the moment I've got set to 4.2. I've got the ratio, 
I've got the attack time in milliseconds, and I've got the release time. Now, because I'm dealing with 48,000 samples per second, that means each millisecond has 48 samples. So this here, the attack in samples, is 50 times 48, and the release in samples is 125.2667 times 48 and I've uh, taken I've rounded that so um, so you always get an integer number there so these are our settings for our compressor um, so the loudness is basically looking back the amount of release and looking for the loudest signal within the B column adjacent to the C column and it looks back the number of uh, samples required for the release. Now, obviously, at the beginning, it can't do this because there aren't rows to go back, which is why I have it wrapped in this max function, which basically says the maximum value it can give is 2, because if you took the value 2, the row value 2, and took off 6,013, you'd end up with a negative number, and uh, that would be bad because you can't find that cell. So... Um, I wrap it in a max function and return two. So that's that column. I hope you're keeping up with this. Right, so the next column's very easy. It's just the difference from the threshold. So if I find a place where we've got some game reduction going on, um, this here basically calculates the difference of the loudness compared to the threshold. So our loudness here is 4.465 and our threshold is 4.2. And the difference between that is 0 0.2654, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's nice and easy. Then I've got a rolling average. Now, if you don't know what a rolling average is, basically what you do is you pick the number uh, adjacent to it in the D column, which is the, uh, the difference from the threshold, and you look at some values before it, a nominal amount before it, and you take the average of them. So if we look here where the sine wave starts, even though the difference from the threshold is 0 0.25 something or other, um, the average, because it's actually this and all of these zeros before it, and there's actually 2,400 zeros before it, that's the, uh, the average that I'm looking for, again, using that indirect function and wrapping it in a max to stop us looking for negative cells that don't exist. But, um, yeah, here it's looking back, and it's only a tiny little bit on the average there because it's got all these zeros that it's taking into account, but then it slowly increases. Now, the reason that that moving average amount is exactly the same as the attack in samples, which is the number of rows, because each row is a sample, um, that gives us our attack time. That moving average is actually giving us the attack time that we're looking for. Right, I'm going to do a cut in here, because I thought I finished last night, and then I realised I still had the release count um, column, which is redundant now. That was from an earlier iteration of the spreadsheet, so... Just to clear things up, I've kind of hidden it, got it out of the way, and uh, I'm going to continue this explanation from the game reduction column. So the game reduction is very, very simple. We basically multiply the average from the E column by the ratio. In this case, the ratio is 1, but if you had a 4 to 1 ratio, that number would be 0.75. If you had a 2 to 1 ratio, that number would be 0.5. Um, so that gives us our amount of game reduction, and then in the final column, which gives us our new values, which make up the final compressed wave file, um, we take the transformed amount, which, if you remember, was the log 10 of uh, this number once we chopped off the sign. We, um, we take the transformed amount and we remove the gain. So we, uh, we say column B minus column G. And then we take that number and we do 10 to the power of that to reverse the log 10. And then we need to finally multiply it by the sine of column A because that will return it being negative or positive again, return it back to its original negative or positive state. And that's our final amount. And then we can copy that column, paste it into here, Run the code, make sure that we're calling samples to WAV, not WAVs to samples, and it will take in the sign samples and output a compressed version of that WAV file. Now, I've already done that, and here it is. You can see the attack time working here. You can see the release time going up there. There's actually a hold time as well, which um, 
I won't get into. That's that's something that I kind of implemented shoddily in the spreadsheet. But in principle, it's working. You've got an attack time and a release time, and you can see the threshold was I set just above the uh, quietest sine wave. So it's uh, coming down, bringing that down to the threshold, and then when it detects the quieter sine wave, it then holds it for the release time and brings it back up. And there we go, that's a compressor in a spreadsheet. So obviously I did that with uh, with sine waves just to test that it was all working. And then I thought, well, let's do it with some drums. So I got my data from the drum sample that I played earlier. And I've got a threshold of three. I've got a ratio of 0.75. So that's a four to one ratio with an attack time of 30 milliseconds and a release time of 10 milliseconds. And uh, process that, copied that out, did the same thing again. Let's uh, put these into Cubase. And there we have the, uh, the drums that are compressed and the original drums, which I'm going to put on top. So if I solo the original drums. And now the compressed drums. So you can hear from that, that's, that's a considerable amount of compression. If I um, put one of the channels out of phase, what we can do is we can hear what's different between the two WAV files. So that there is the difference between the two files. And you can hear all those bass drums and snare drums punching through which is exactly what you'd expect from a real compressor. Well, this is a real compressor, albeit crazily implemented in a spreadsheet. Um, it's an audio compressor in a spreadsheet, as promised in the title of the video. So I hope I didn't disappoint you. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, please subscribe, please leave me a comment. I love replying to the comments. And if you've enjoyed this uh, audio spreadsheet journey, then please share it with another friend of yours who may also enjoy it. The files and links and all of that will be in the description. So if you want to have a play about with it, improve it, there's probably a million and one ways it can be improved. Uh, please feel free and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you very much.